Good morning, and welcome to Calvary Fargo. We are excited to see you all here this morning. Um, please stand if you're able, and I'm just going to share a little passage from Ephesians 1, 17 to 19. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance to the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. God says here he wants us to know him. He wants us to find hope in him, and he calls us to praise and worship him. Let us do that together this morning. Shining in the light of your glory 
Well, good morning, Calvary. We're so excited for you to join us this morning in the house of the Lord. And this is such a wonderful time to be in God's grace. And it's such a beautiful day outside. So we just want to make sure we just give God all the glory this morning. And so we say welcome, welcome, welcome. Everybody who is joining us, if you're joining us by virtual campus, we want to say welcome this morning. We're excited to be in the house of the Lord. This is part of the service where we just take a few minutes just to, if there's anything on our hearts that are burdening us, kind of getting in the way between just freely worshiping the Lord, we want to confess that together as a congregation and give it to the Lord. And so some of us may be feeling some burdens this morning. We just want to give those to the Lord and trust the Lord to take those burdens to ease our hearts. And then we just want to worship God with all our mind, heart, soul, and spirit. So I will read what's in the white, and you read what's in the gold in the bold. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please take a moment of silent reflection between you and the Lord. Amen. Most merciful God. We confess we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. And the church said, amen. Let us continue in worship together.
us pray. God, we want to praise you today for all that you are, even more than the words of these songs. You are so much more. You are holy and you are merciful. You are faithful. You are worthy. Thank you for fearfully and wonderfully creating each and every one of us. Thank you for the joy and the contentment that comes from you alone. Thank you for your unconditional love. Thank you for our salvation that you gave us through the sacrifice of Jesus. And thank you for being our heavenly father, for refining us and for convicting us when we need it. Help us to live our lives in such a way that our actions serve as a reflection of your own grace and your mercy. And may we always give you the glory and the honor that you deserve. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And please just take a moment to welcome your neighbors. stop you never stop working no hello by the piano go back to the piano way maker amen I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And our scripture reading today is from Colossians chapter 3, verse 18 to chapter 4, verse 1. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Thanks. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm going to ask um, McCoy to play that chorus, the bridge part for Waymaker, uh, just for a second. Because I think that's a... I think our church needs right now to know that God is never stopped working. We're going to be talking about some very difficult things today after service. And I think it's important that we realize that whatever we're stepping into, wherever God is taking us as a congregation, as a church, that he's already gone before us. 
because he never stops working. We are relying on you today because we know that you are a way maker. Lord, all of our burdens, all of our cares, everything that may be hindering us at this moment, distracting us from just focusing on your goodness, Lord, we ask that you remove it. And help us to see the problem with your eyes, Lord. When we're in the midst of the problem, it seems so big, Lord, but from your vantage point, it's but just a pinpoint dot, a small point in history, and you've already made a way. Father, we love you. We magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I was told last minute that I was going to have lots of friends on the stage with me. And I'm not sure I trust this character back here. He looks kind of hungry and he has his mouth open and I don't know if I'm going to be his leg of lamb. I guess I'll be a leg of human. So just keep an eye on him and warn me if he moves up a little bit. Just uh <laughs> All right. So... um <clears throat> If I can have the ushers come out, um, we were at annual conference. Oh, really? One, two, three, four. We were at annual conference and uh, found out some new information in terms of just where things we've been struggling with with the church in terms of what does it look like to try to leave the United Methodist Church. And our church has been in those discussions for a while along with other churches. And so um, one of the things they require, and, and it's good for us to know because we took a survey back in March, um, and the congregation overwhelmingly felt that way, but as for now, we want to see if the congregation still feel that way. So if you're a member of this church, we're going to ask that you raise your hands, and all right, it's not showing me love, Brian. I may have to reboot. There we go. Um, I'm going to put an electronic QR code up. You can fill it out on your phone or you can fill it out manually with a hand copy. Uh, in terms of the voting, you have to be a member of the church to actually vote and have your vote count um, when it comes time for the vote to decide whether or not we want to disaffiliate, that is, leave the United Methodist Church. And so I am not going to fight with this thing. So thank you, Brian. Um, I will probably just call out my slides. And so when you're done with those, uh, just feel free to, uh, Steve, where do you want to put them? You want them to drop in the ushering box? You want them to hand them to you? How do you want them to be collected? Sir Steve. Hello, Steve. Hello, Steve. <laughs> no worries. Uh, do you want them to drop those in the offering box or do you want to collect those at the door? How do you want to? At the door. So when you're done with them, just fold them, and when you get ready to leave, just hand them at the door. He'll collect them then. We're going to compile all that information over the week. Uh, we'll send out the results just like we did last time, and all of this information goes to the district superintendent, and it goes to all the uh, uh, conference leadership and organizations and offices. And so all of that information will be passed on to them, but that will give us an idea. But um, if you are a constituent, of the congregation or you just love Calvary and would just like to have your voice heard, um, feel free to fill out one and just mark on there, hey, I just love Calvary or I'm a constituent. I just want to let you know where I stand with the church and because uh, that's good information to know also. So, um, again, it doesn't count in the, the calculations of the information we have to send to the conference, uh, but it does help us as the church to kind of know uh, who's kind of walking and journeying along with us in this process.
technology is working now. So with that, um, if everybody has a chance to use this QR code, anybody who wanted to use it and do it electronically, go ahead and give you a couple of seconds now because I'm going to be changing slides. Feel free to do that while I am going through the sermon. The sermon is going to be pretty short today because we have a lot of activity afterwards, and so I don't want to extend uh, uh, beyond a long time since we have other business to take care of. So following the service, there is a town hall regarding all the information dealing with annual conference dealing with a conversation with disaffiliation, and hopefully if we have enough people for a quorum, the church council will meet in here right after the town hall meeting along with Zoom. Uh, people can join by Zoom, and we will have some discussion, and we'll vote whether or not to go ahead and initiate that process. So please be in prayerful discernment uh, as we go through that process this morning. All right, so we're going to be continuing our sermon series and to Jesus' image. We are studying the Colossians. And so I want to thank Randy Spar and Mike Anderson for uh, stepping in and filling in in the pulpit, allowing me to get away for a couple of Sundays and get some rejuvenation. And so we were down in Vegas doing some evangelism among the sinners on the strip. Uh, we did not enjoy ourselves. We want you to know we were doing the work of the Lord, crying aloud and sparing knots by, while putting pennies in slot machines. So... Um, that's a joke. I, we don't do the slot machines. So, um, so with that, we were just excited again to get a little break. Hopefully, we'll get a little more break. And so this week, we're going to be talking about family systems. Family systems. What does it look like when uh, God uses the family to teach us what it means to bear the image of Jesus? Now, some of the things I have to kind of discuss up front is the fact that I'm not sure if we're all aware, but the family, at least in America, is pretty much under attack. There is this concerted effort to redefine what family looks like. There's a concentrated effort, concerted effort to say that, you know what, um, a, a, a man and a woman and some kids is just so 20th century and it's not in vogue anymore. And yet the statistics tell us that, you know, if a child grows up in a two-parent home with parents that's just willing to work, that alone can help them get out of poverty. That fact alone, those, those few factors, there's very few factors that can help a generation move from poverty to out of poverty in a generation, and that's one of those. And, and it's just the simple math that uh, if you have two incomes, you're probably going to be able to fare a lot better moving forward in your family in terms of if um, and I'm discussing from a poverty standpoint, out of poverty to give your children and your children's children a better opportunity. And so the, the family is under attack. This idea of family, it wants to be redefined by a lot of different people, a lot of different forces, a lot of different perspectives on what family can look like. And are there non-traditional families? Yes. Are there circumstances where, you know, maybe a parent dies or the relationship doesn't work out? Yes. Those are all um, understand some of the brokenness that comes with just in the human experience, but as a whole, God intended for those who create children to raise their children and then hopefully be guardians and partners to their children's children and their children's children's children as you build legacy and as you build the generations. And so that is God's intent. He intends for there to be this family dynamic to create healthy structures that birth life into each subsequent generation. Now, in every family, every family has their issues. How many know that? Every family has their issues. Every family has a certain level of quote-unquote dysfunction. So if you think your family is normal, wait until you visit somebody else's family and see how theirs operate, and you might be like, well... Ours is more normal than their normal. And then maybe our normal is uh, not as normal as their normal because we all come with different values, different cultures, different backgrounds. And what one family esteems as valuable, another family may not esteem as valuable. But for the most part, all of us in families have some common things that we hope will be um, significant to, we would want to pass down to our children, such as integrity. Always do the right thing when no one's looking. That's a value that I would say most of our families in here probably hold to. 
look out for one another. I would dare to say that's a value that most of us hold as a family. We teach our siblings, hey, that's your brother, that's your sister. You guys don't fight. You guys look out for one another. And so there's just a lot of values we share, but sometimes when those values um, don't come through in a generation, maybe there's some dysfunction that happens that goes beyond just kind of the normal spectrum of uh, within the uh, spectrum of normalcy that kind of goes outside of that and it kind of creates some uh, dysfunction for subsequent generations, that's when what we get in what's called family systems. So you may see someone who is struggling with, uh, let's say, an addiction or or maybe they're struggling with uh, self-esteem issues. And then if you were to look at their family system, you would say, well, what happened in your household? Well, maybe they had an overbearing father or or a very critical mother. And they would say things and maybe the child never felt like they were good enough. And so now they have self-esteem issues where they're always questioning themselves and they don't feel like they bring any value to the world or any worth. And so one of the ways you can look at that is called a genogram. If you want to kind of map out what your family system looks like, you can use what's called a genogram. And genogram is used in psychology. It's used to track, you know, your heritage, addictions, um, medical. You can kind of look at medical, what, who had what and what was kind of passed on. And so the boxes and the circles kind of represent male and female. And you kind of see your lineage going down. And then you can do something like this, this kind of tree breakdown. But then you can also add squiggly lines and other things that represent different um, events or different conditions that might have happened in your family. So sometimes they'll use a squiggly line to say that, hey, there was someone um, that had an addiction. Or maybe they'll use something to say that this person had a mental disorder. And then you kind of watch your family tree. And then you would even track if there's been divorces and how this family has split out from this family. And then with a single picture, you can kind of explain to your children This is why mom and dad are the way they are, (laughs) because of what happened with the parents and grandparents. But in that, you can also tell the story of this is why we are as resilient as we are, because we've come through some things and God was faithful through the different parts of what we've experienced. Now we can say, look, look what God has done. And you now get to blaze your trail for what you want to do for your family. So when you add a lot of lines It starts to look like this. And you start tracking all the families. This one is done for heritage. They're tracking all the different heritages. Uh, You know, there's Puerto Rican, French, Irish, and they're just saying, hey, you can kind of see how the family lineage, what it looks like. And for those who love to be tech savvy, you can do this on something like Ancestry.com. But with all of that, again, you kind of track everything that is happening In your family tree, you can kind of see the dysfunctions that are happening in your family tree. If there are some, you can talk about those. If there's been substance abuse or other abuses, you can kind of track those and see those. Because as I said, uh, Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And one of the main things he wants to steal, kill, and destroy is the family. So he wants to introduce unhealthy factors into the family. He wants to introduce Things like pornography. He wants to introduce alcoholism. He wants to introduce abuse. He wants to introduce uh, unresolved anger. He wants to introduce those things because he wants to create dysfunction in the family. And if you want to get a really good idea of some of the ideology or some of the forces that are against the family, I'm going to recommend a documentary to you. Again, when I mention things, I don't mention things because I agree with a person's certain political, philosophical perspective. But if the information is valuable, I'll introduce it no matter what the source, barring a Satanist. Um, but there is a new documentary that came out. It's called What is a Woman by Matt Walsh. And if you really want to see kind of the ideology, how, how superfluous and ambiguous that terms are being created in order to redefine family, to deconstruct what they call the nuclear Western family, the patriarchal family, the biblical understanding of family, 
then this will give you a really good idea into that. So with this, we're going to go to the scriptures, and we're just going to look at five ways. I'm not going to focus in on the wives, the husband, the children for the sake of the wives, the husband, and children. Because each of your marriages and your families are different. Some of you have a very traditional marriage, what they call the patriarchy. Strong male uh, authority figure is the head. Uh, followed by the wife and then children. Some of you have a more egalitarian approach where you say, well, you know what? It's more 50-50. We are looking at each other the same. We discuss and we come to a consensus and we go about family that way. Some of you may have a complementarian marriage where you said, well, we realize that God created us differently and we just have distinct roles. And so we just want to fulfill our God calling in the role that God has called us. Wherever you land on that spectrum, I'm not going to get into that today. I'm going to trust that you are following the will of God for your family and that it operates best with the strengths that God has gifted each and every each one of you to use in that relationship for the nurturing and raising of your children. So I'm going to look at this in terms of what God commanded each person and how we can use what he commanded for us to look at Jesus, to look like Jesus. So let's go to verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as fitting to the Lord. The first way that we can help, the first thing we can look at a relationship that helps us to look like Jesus is we have to submit like Jesus. God commands the wife to submit to the husband, but Jesus submitted to the Father's will. Jesus had a heart of submission. He says, whatever I see the Father do, I do that. And so he, Jesus was concerned about having a heart of submission. So the first way for us to look like Jesus, to bear the image of Jesus, we have to be willing to submit like Jesus. And so how do we submit like Jesus? And I phrase it this way. It's basically about surrendering your will wholeheartedly, intentionally, and then with full understanding to who we are submitting. You want to submit wholeheartedly. You want to submit intentionally because this is the will. And the will is you get to make a choice. The, the scriptures doesn't say wives obey your husbands. It says wives submit. Christ submit unto the Father. So we submit like Christ. We submit wholeheartedly. We submit intentionally. We by choice say that with my will I submit. And that's part of our sacrifice. And then we do it with full understanding to who we are submitting. For those of you who are not married, this is very important. If you're going to be in a relationship and you're going to either, if you're going to have this kind of hierarchical submission or if you're going to have a mutual submission or whatever that dynamic looks like in your relationship, you should really understand, have full understanding, who is it that I'm going to give my life to that I'm going to be willing to submit my will to? You should vet that person inside and out before you say, I do. You should have your entire community, your family, your church community. If you got some, if you're, if, you're, if you're a young lady, you should get some big brothers. If you don't have any big brothers and uncles, get some of them out of the church. And make sure there's some big burly dudes so they can have some intimidation factors. And let them vet that person and find out who they really are. If it's vice versa, have some ladies. Have some women who are willing to nitpick that woman and really see what she's about. Have your community involved with that because marriage involves mutual submission. No matter where you, there's going to be some give and take throughout a relationship. And you definitely, if you're going to be submitting to a person, have full understanding to who you are submitting. The scriptures then go on to say in verse 19, husband, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So the second way we do this is we have to love like Jesus. The scripture says, husband, love your wives. And in Ephesians it says, as Christ loved the church. So what does it look like or how do we love like Jesus? We have to be willing to surrender the heart. First we surrender the will, but then we have to be willing to surrender the heart. So how did Jesus love his bride? 
How did he love his bride, the church? He was willing to give himself up and die for us, so he loved her sacrificially. We have to love sacrificially. In other words, we have to be willing to put it all on the table. I think um, the NBA finals are going right now, and they say that when you get out on the floor, you leave everything on the floor. You go hard in the paint, you leave nothing else, so there's no question, no doubt, if I win or lose, at the end, I gave it everything I had. We have to love sacrificially. We have to leave it all on the floor. We have to love redemptively. Jesus did this to redeem his bride. We love in such a way as we try to make the other person whole or complete. A debt is a deficiency that we owe someone else. We don't want there to be any debt in their lives. We want to offer all that we have to make that person whole or complete. And then we love restoratively. We want to make sure that everything we're doing leads them to the Lord, leads them in right relationship with Jesus. We want to be pointing people to Jesus. We want to love in that way so that they have a right relationship, that they are completely restored and reconciled with the Father. It then goes on to say in verse 20, Children, obey your parents and everything, for this pleases the Lord. And so number three is we want to obey like Jesus. We want to obey like Jesus. And how was Jesus willing to obey? Jesus surrendered his hands and his feet. In other words, all of his actions. Where submitting is a choice of the will and you surrender your will, obeying is a surrendering of your actions, that you're going to actually go and do something. How many know that you can obey someone but not be submitted to them? Just because you do something doesn't mean you've submitted to that person. It doesn't mean that you're in covenant or in relationship with that person. You can do it. You can do something for someone and actually be in defiance to the person. How many have seen um, uh, some movies? Sometimes there will be a movie, and, and, and I've seen this a lot of time in military movies. The commander or the person will give an order. Private so-and-so, I want you to do whatever. And with their voice, they'll say, yes, sir. They'll go do it, but they've done it in defiance. And so we want to obey like Jesus. Jesus was always prepared to go. He was never defiant of the Father. He willingly wanted to go. He desired to go. And then we must be willing to do it by faith. We have to have full faith and trust in God the Father. Full faith and trust in God the Father so that we can obey, so that our actions are following like Jesus. Verse 21, it says, fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. So number five, we need to father like Jesus, which is kind of odd because Jesus didn't have any children, physical children. But as the second person of the Trinity and our great Lord and Savior who has reigned from the beginning, he has had children among us. And he has nurtured and cared for us. And he gave his life for us. And so we need to father like Jesus. And what's really important here is that the scriptures kind of give this negative command where it says, do not, fathers, do not embitter your children. Don't be harsh with your children. Don't discourage your children. And so how did Jesus father the disciples, father us in the church? How does he act as a father? Well, first off, Jesus surrenders his ego. How did he demonstrate that? He was willing to wash the feet of the people who were his enemy on the night of the Last Supper. The guy he knew who was going to betray him, he washed his feet and he offered him a meal. The guy he knew was going to doubt him, he washed his feet and offered him a meal. And even prayed for him that I pray that you will be restored in the end and that you will go and restore others. So we have to develop, teach, nurture, and disciple with all humility. Because our Lord and Savior was a humble person. 
even though he had the authority and all the power of heaven, he was humble. He never tried to lord it over anybody. He never tried to, I mean, he could have called down legions from heaven. But even more so, here's something I want to share with you. Maybe this is kind of an early Father's Day sermon. But I just want to share some of the statistics of kids who don't grow up without a, who grow up without a father in the home. It says this uh, from one of the websites uh, citing some of the statistics from the U.S. Department of Justice. The negative effects of a child without a father can be seen in countless studies and reports. The statistics show the importance of a father figure in the majority of children's lives. According to an article, what can the federal government do to decrease crime and revitalize communities from the U.S. Department of Justice? Children from fatherless home account for 63% of youth suicides. 90% of all homeless and runaway youths. 85% of all children that exhibit behavioral disorders. 71% of all high school dropouts. 70% of juveniles and state-operated institutions. 75% of adolescent patients in substance abuse centers. And 75% of rapists motivated by displaced anger. So when I talk about that documentary earlier that wants to blur the lines of gender roles and and, and the studies way back in the 70s where they they did the research and it says, well, it doesn't matter if a father is in the home. Divorce doesn't have an impact on children. And they did that experiment and then they came to learn a few decades later, oh, we guess we were wrong. Sorry we destroyed so many households in the process because... And professing to be wise, we were foolish. And that is the kind of the ideology and the philosophy that's out there right now. There's a lot of professing to be wise, yet demonstrating that you are foolish. And when the statistics are telling you the importance of a father in the home and how it can change the impact and the trajectory of a child's life, you can't listen to the overall theology. Uh, yeah, and I guess that is a very good word for it theology, philosophy, or religious belief from a secular culture that tells you, well, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. It doesn't matter if you're a father or a mother. Because children are going to be okay regardless, and the statistics are staring you in the face telling you that is not the case. That is not the case. So we have to father like Jesus. Last but not least, let us Go to next verse, verse 22. It says this, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it, not only when their eyes are on you and to curry favor, but with sincerity of heart and the reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. And so, the last way to look like Jesus is to become empty, poured out like Jesus. Become empty and poured out like Jesus. When you are a slave, you have no rights. You make no decisions. You have no autonomy. And slavery is a global institution that has been existing since the beginning of time. So no matter what you hear about it, you know, whatever you read about it, if you say, oh, in the Greco-Roman times or in U.S. history or in current modern trafficking, whatever that slavery looks like, when a person loses their autonomy and their will and they can make no decisions for themselves, no matter what that level of is, uh, just know that. That's not a good place for that person. However, the freedom is if I surrender myself into bond servitude and servitude to Christ, then it's not a slavery like human-made slavery. That's why Paul was willing to call himself the doulos, the slave of Jesus. Because he knew that in Jesus, even though I'm a slave, the slavery in Jesus is sonship. 
It's gaining an inheritance. It's having the beauty of Christ in my life. And I get to become a son of the Most High. And in that sonship, I surrender everything. When we are the servant of Jesus Christ, the doulos, the slave of Jesus, we surrender everything. That's what Jesus did for the Father. It says this in Philippians chapter 2. Verse 6, who being in the very nature of God, that is Jesus, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Jesus was willing to surrender everything. And so as I invite the worship team back up, That is going to be my challenge for all of us. How can we surrender everything? How can we live a life where we are withholding nothing from Jesus? Jesus, my heart, my soul, my mind, my possessions, my family, everything that I have, Lord, I give it to you. It's yours. And I'm just a steward. Teach me to steward well what you've entrusted to me. So that you may be glorified. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord. Lord, in all of our relationships, continue to teach us what it means to do it the way Jesus did it. Because, Father, we want to be like Jesus. We want to obey like Jesus. We want to love like Jesus. We want to surrender our egos and, and, and we want to just give up everything so that we can be conformed to the image of Jesus. Because there's a world that needs to see more of Christ and less of us. They need to see more of love and less of labels. They need to see your heart more than our hubris. So teach us, God. Show us the way. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. And you can feel free to either sit or stand. If you want to sing, you can. Or if you want to just pray some of these words back to God, whatever you feel fit. I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet and I'm caught up in this holy moment and I never want to leave oh I'm not here for blessing Jesus, you don't owe me anything, and more than anything that you can do, I just want you. And I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motion, I'm sorry. When I've just sang another song, take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. And I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry 
when I've forgotten you're enough and take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you and I'm caught up in your presence and I just want to sit here at your feet and I'm caught up in this holy moment and I never want to leave oh I'm not here for blessings and Jesus you don't know me just want you I just want you nothing else nothing else nothing else will do I just want you nothing else nothing else Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. And I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. And I'm caught up in your presence. And I just want to sit here at your feet. And I'm caught up in this holy moment. And I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for pleasure. And Jesus, you don't owe me anything, and more than anything that you can do, I just want you. I just want you. I just want you. If you're partaking in communion with us this morning, we invite you to take your elements. Just raise your hands and our ushers will bring it to you. So we take our hearts and minds to the foot of the cross, remember what Jesus has done for us. We humbly take our our bread in our cup. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and after he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do so in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took the cup he had given thanks. He said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant that I shed for you. As often as you drink, do so in remembrance of me.
Because when we eat the bread and drink the cup, we do proclaim, that is, we preach the gospel until the Lord comes again. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your broken body and your shed blood, Lord, that we can be made right once again with you, Lord. Lord, you have already paved the way. So all of our sins and all of our transgressions, all of our brokenness, we give it to you at the cross. We nail it to the cross, for you have nailed it to the cross, Lord. And we walk in the freedom that we have in you. You've called us to be free in you. Help us to live and walk in that freedom. In Christ's holy name we pray. Um, we're going to be having a town hall meeting immediately following our benediction right in here. So if you're desiring to stay here uh, to participate and sit in on that, to know what's going on with annual conference and what we're going to be doing next to the church, and what, especially if you'd like to share your opinion, we want to hear from everybody as part of our congregation. Uh, just feel free to stay in here and kind of come towards the front. And then um, if you desire prayer, if it's okay, I'm going to ask the prayer team to take people over to 115. And uh, so, Becky, all right, so if you desire prayer, just let Becky know, and she'll guide you over to room 115. We'll ask the prayer ministry to go over there and pray with folks who desire prayer. And then um, those will be the two big things I have. So, barring anything else. All right, let's say our benediction together. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me put or set aside for you. Praise for you or criticize for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and surrender all, all things, your glory and service. And now... O oh, wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it also be made in heaven. And the church said, amen. And if you have those surveys, please hand those to Steve in the back. If you're leaving, if you're staying, uh, just feel free to run it back there or just hold it in the meeting and we'll pick them up.